Welcome to the Matt Beck Podcast. Woke up this way. He's got a lot of cool stuff he's going to show you today. The latest news, industry topics, and business tips. For all hairstylists and salon owners, it's time to flip the script. Grab your precision scissors, barber combs, and swivel twist razors. Let's cut a bob, a quick shag, pixie cut with a little bit of flavor. Check out the live classes, product reviews, let's rock on. Don't forget to check out freesaloneducation.com. I woke up this way. It's going to be a great day. Chop it, clip it, spray it, flip it. I woke up this way. What's up, guys? How are you? Welcome to the show. Super excited to have you guys all logging in. I see you already. Jess Mack, I see you. Uh, Lynn, what's up? Glennis, see you. Blanca, good to see you. Akashe, Lynn, awesome. All of you guys are getting logged in. Now, remember, there's two things that we do uh, at this show. If you have a question, type Q and put your question. Today, I've got Andrew Carruthers from Sam Villa. Uh, hanging out with us. He's going to be doing some texturizing techniques with you guys. It's going to be super fun. And uh, if you're new to the show, type new in the chat so that we can say hi and everybody can uh, get to know who you are because that's what this is all about. It's about building community, having a good time, and learning uh, together. So uh, without further ado, let me bring on my my good friend, Andrew Carruthers. That's not how I want you on here. There we go. What's up, bud? <laughs> How are you? Putting me in the slaw box, man. I know, right? I'm like, he's down there in the corner. <laughs> What's up? <laughs> How are you? Um, I'm good. I'm good. I, my my face is all, I think, still a little uh, wind burned from my weekend of camping out in the rain and cold. <laughs> other than that, man, I'm feeling refreshed and like just happy to be home in the warm, in some warmth. And um, yeah, I stoked to be here and do what I love to do best, which is share some content. I know it's so funny. Like, uh, you know, you're telling me about your weekend, um, camping and all that. And I'm super jealous cause I literally haven't left my house much. So, uh, yeah. so to live, where, where are you exactly located? You're in, uh, I'm in, I'm in Southern Oregon. Okay. So pretty small town. We're only about like 15 minutes North of the California border. Okay. Um, we've got a, a town north of us called Medford, a town south of us called Ashland. And even those two towns, like those are the ones that maybe a few people have heard of, but yeah. even those two towns are pretty small. Well, uh, well it, it, I'm sure it's beautiful. Uh, so, awesome. all right, cool. So I'm so excited for you to be here. You said you're going to do some texturizing. So why don't you uh, explain to us what's going to happen today? Cool. One of the things that we always look for in education are what are these pieces that sometimes get missed that are so incredibly important to our end result. And I think most of us were probably taught that, you know, you kind of have your build, building the, the basic shape kind of phase of your haircut, and then you have kind of a texturizing and detailing kind of phase to your haircut. But during that texturizing and detailing phase, what often happens is we, uh, we lose track of principles, like basic principles of hairdressing. So, what we kind of want to share with you today is fundamentals and foundations of how to approach your texturizing process and detailing process within your haircuts. And we'll talk about it from a different, a couple different angles because <laughs> angle actually being <laughs> one of them, <laughs> you know, the angle of approach to the actual hair strand is going to be very important. The elevation and the direction within the section is going to be very important which tool you choose will be very important. And we have to think about it on what is the fabric we are working on? Is it fine? Is it medium? Is it coarse? Is it super, super dense with little fine strands? Is it very, very sparse with very coarse strands? Do we have curl pattern to the hair? You know, there's so many different aspects that go into how we approach that texturizing process. But what we see often, Matt, is that we'll kind of watch people going through their process. And when they start to get into this texturizing and detailing process, sometimes we can go a little just uh, fly by the seat of our pants, just kind of choose our favorite texturizing technique and just start going after the hair. Yeah. So um, what we hope to do today is to uh, get this process that's so essential to having a great finished product, but give it some actual um, thoughtful approach and method to it. Perfect. Yeah. Sounds awesome. So we're not going to necessarily get a haircut in today, Matt, but it's just going to be lots and lots of discussion. And 
as Matt said, I'm open for questions. So if you have questions on the approach to texturizing and detailing, please go ahead and throw them into the, the comments. It looks like Matt would like you to put a Q on there if uh, if you have a specific question. Yeah. So let, let's get into kind of the first part of this. So we'll start with talking about two things, which is the angle of approach and whether you work from the inside out or outside in. Was that a question, Matt? No, that was just somebody saying that we're the two best educators on YouTube. So what? I thought, you know, <laughs> let's do it. Let's uh, let's post that one up there. Yeah, let's <laughs> post that. <laughs> and we wear hats. We both wear hats. Well, let's be honest <laughs> why I'm wearing a hat. Um, look at yeah. this mess. Yeah. Yeah. It's, uh, yeah, I know. That's kind of where I'm at, too. I've been, I actually have been giving myself quarantine haircuts, guys, and I'm getting pretty good at it, I have to say, <laughs> but I cannot wait to go sit in my barber's chair again. For sure. Mainly just because he's an awesome dude, <laughs> and I like to talk to him. <laughs> it's funny, like, we we keep thinking about all these things, like, well, are gonna, am I going to lose my clients to, you know, people doing their hair at home and stuff, and man, it, no. I don't think so, because yeah. even for me, as a professional hairdresser, as someone that actually teaches how to cut hair, I don't want to cut my own hair. Yeah, It's a pain in the butt. It doesn't come out as good as what he does. And the big thing is, I just like going and sitting in his chair and talking to him. So um, I think we're going to be okay. This is what I love about everyone at San Via. So like, just the way you guys prepare things to teach, you're literally putting thumbtacks in the head. <laughs> yeah, I'm like watching. I'm like, how's he sticking it? that to the hair? Oh yeah, thumbtack. <laughs> I, I should probably say this in advance. Don't, Don't try this on a normal uh, no. live model, please. <laughs> yeah, guys. But that's oh, awesome. That's plastic, a great yeah. idea. What a great idea. Yeah. So the reason I'm putting this in here is I want it to be very, very clear what the result we're getting, and having that contrast I think is going to be really helpful. Now, of course. Contrast is one of the things that is super important when we start to think about how we texturize hair, because let's think about the reasons that we texturize hair. It might be weight removal, just to remove some density from the hair, but in that case, maybe we don't actually wanna see physical separation. Maybe we're just looking to reduce the bulk, but still keep something that feels very solid, or Maybe it's both. Maybe we're looking to reduce bulk, but we're also looking to create some visual separation. Right. Or third option would be I want to create visual separation, but I want to minimize how much weight I take out of the hair because all three of those are possibilities. Of course, a range in between that. So visual separation comes from creating contrast. There has to be space. So if you look at this right now, because all the hair is fairly even, of course, there's a little less distribution of hair down here, but because it's all fairly even, Matt, it looks like just a sheet of hair. But even if I just physically kind of separate these out a little bit, now we start to see that separation. Right. So that's how we kind of have to think about our texturizing process. Because if I want to just reduce weight, but I don't want to see separation, then I don't want to come in and carve big chunks out of the hair because that's going to give me visual separation then. So I want to be very soft with that. But on the other side, what ends up happening very often is we're like, oh, I want to, you know, we see all these really cool, like highly textured bobs and stuff. And with those highly textured bobs, people will come in and they'll take their thinning shear or blending shear, whatever you call it, and they'll close that a couple times through it just really softly. And I go, why am I not getting separation? Well, because all you're doing is putting tiny, tiny little holes throughout that shape. That's not going to give you vis visual separation because you didn't create contrast. Right. So um, that's kind of first thing to think about is what is the result you're trying to achieve with with your approach because that's really going to change the approach 
And Lynn, I see your question up there, but uh, and it's about curly hair, and I think he's going to get into some curly hair. I can see that he curled some of it. So um, yeah, yeah, okay. and I have I have a couple of different rates of curl that we'll talk about. So yeah, we'll, we'll talk about even like super super curly too. Very cool. All right, so as we look at this, there's kind of two things we have to think about. Well, first we decide what's that end result we're looking for. Then we want to choose techniques that get us to our end result the fastest possible, the most efficiently possible. So there's two ways that you can kind of approach this texturizing. We can work from in or outside in which typically what we're talking about with outside in is point cutting, deep uh, notching, uh, scanning. There's lots of different terms for it. But typically, if we're going to work from the outside in, from the ends inward, that's going to be uh, some type of point cutting, notching, something like that. Inside out, we actually have quite a few different techniques because there's, of course, what we call slicing, which would be holding the hair and kind of working through this way. There's slide cutting. There is notching, slithering. <laughs> There's all different approaches, but really um, the concept is the same. You're starting from the interior and working to the ends. So the first thing we want to um, kind of think about is where do I want to see the texture or where do I want to remove the weight? So if the weight that I want to remove is mainly through the ends, or if I want to just see visual texture mainly through the ends, then an outside in or an ends first approach, that might be the most efficient way to go. For example, if I wanted to create something that I just have this kind of nice choppy textured ends, then working this way very deliberately with big peaks and valleys, that's going to give me more of that separated texture through the, the ends. It's a good visual. Yeah, and I, I could potentially do that, Matt, from coming this way, but I feel like I have a little more control if I work outside in, if I'm just trying to focus on those ends. So, and it's really, really important to understand that our opinion on education is that this is all just based on different experiences and you might have a different view on this and that's awesome. So um, please never take anything that we share as us saying, this is the right way to do things Yeah. because we believe that there shouldn't be, well, this is the right way to cut hair and this is the wrong way to cut hair. It's all processes. And if it works for you and it gets you to your end result, high five, that's the way you, to approach it. So we're just sharing with you some of, some of our personal concepts. Yeah, I think like the number one thing is like, you know, get to the end result that you want, right? And mm -hmm. then once you learn to get to the end result that you want, then you learn to be more efficient at getting to that end result and figure out different ways of learning techniques that get you there more efficiently um, right. with, this, with the end result that you're looking for, right? Totally. Yep, exactly. And I think that if, if you... If you find yourself picking up the same pair of shears, going through the exact same process all the time, definitely time to pick up a mannequin or a friend that doesn't mind you experimenting a little bit and try a different process to get to your end result. Yeah. Okay, so with inside out cutting, then we have where we're working from the inside, working out. Now here's a couple important distinctions to make too. For the most part, when you say slide cutting, people can look at this two different ways. So um, it might be that slide cutting looks like opening the shear and then moving as you slowly close the shear. It also might mean some people will, you'll actually see them slide cutting like this. We call that talking because it's kind of more like a <laughs> kind of movement, <laughs> right? Yep. This is actually our slide cutting shear. This is designed to allow the hair to push a little bit. So um, we feel more comfortable with that kind of just close as you go 
versus this with Got this it. particular shear. With this shear, the seven inch dry cutting shear, which is the polar opposite, is meant to grab a hold of the hair and really catch it firmly. If I work this way with that kind of constant pressure, a couple things can happen. We can kind of rip up the cuticle a little bit if we're not moving uh, consistently with the speed of our shear, or we can just take way too much hair off. So um, you can see, I barely touched it and it took a lot of hair. So um, sometimes with a more traditional shear, doing that kind of slight talking movement helps a lot of people keep more control over it. So I have a question. Um, so, yes. and this is from me, but uh, so when I use a dry cutting scissor, the dry cutting scissor that I use has a real thick blade to it. I noticed that yours doesn't, but it does have, it looks like um, kind of like a, not, I don't, for the lack of better words, a bone down the center of it or like a thicker portion. Explain yeah. your dry cutting blade and how, how, why it's a dry cutting scissor as opposed to a wet cutting scissor. Cool. So um, just one clarification too, we actually don't call it a dry cutting shear. Okay. Because we, that you can slide cut on wet hair too. Okay. So we designate it as a slide cutting shear. Okay. Because also this one is called our dry cutting shear. This is the one yeah, that's that the opposite one. end of the spectrum. Yeah, that's the one I was talking about, that one. Oh, okay, okay. So the dry cutting shear, because a lot of companies call a dry cutting, their slide cutting shear a dry cutting shear. Okay. This one, we call it a dry cutting shear because, yes, that little extra material that you see right Down there. The yep. What that does is when we're cutting dry hair, we want this shear to plow through it really easily. So that little extra rigidity keeps the contact contact point of the shear intact with each other. Because what happens with, let me grab a, one of our lighter weight shears. So like this one, the Streamline series shear, come on camera, there we go. You can see it has kind of a thinner blade to it. So if you put a ton of super thick dry hair between two blades like this that are kind of a little lighter and a little skinnier, that dry hair, because it's stronger, is going to push the blades open. Yeah. That's where you get the fold. That's where you get the push, even if your shears are super, super sharp. So the reason we designated this one as the dry cutting shear which it absolutely can be used on wet hair too. Okay. But the reason we designated it as that is that extra structure in the blade makes it so, I mean, this is my mannequin that I'm allowed to just kind of chop hair on. <laughs> I mean, this is a lot of hair. Yeah. It just like plows yeah. through it. Yeah. This is one. my favorite um, shear over comb shear too. Okay. Because it's kind of the same strength. thing. Yeah. Just the strength, like you do not push hair at all with it. It just, <laughs> That's plows cool. through it. Yeah. Okay. So that, that makes sense to me. Uh, that was a, a great visual, um, of having like a scissor that is for sliding. Like that's mm -hmm. what, cause I always say the dry cutting scissor is a slide. Like I don't call it a slide cutting scissor, but that makes a lot more sense than calling mm -hmm. it. Cause if I cut, if I wanted to cut an actual precision type cut or precision lines in a dry cut, I wouldn't pick up this scissor. So no, because it's a good way in to... contrast here. Let's do that with the slide cutting shear. Same chunk of hair. Watch. Yep. yep. See, and it, it pushes it right out of the shear. Yeah. So the style of this shear is you have that big rounded blade. Yeah. So the, the, the blades actually curve outwards. Yeah. And you have the sword blade on this side, but then you have a skinny blade on this side. So it's actually meant to almost act like a slightly dulled shear in some ways. I yeah. hate saying that, but you know, because I don't want you to think it's going to not, not be an cut. efficient shear. Right. Yeah. But it'll perform more like that really soft push. And right. so as you're dry or slide cutting through the hair, you, you just have a little more nuance to it. It yeah. doesn't just grab a hold of the hair and cut. Yep. So not which is also better for the cuticle too. So I, I don't want to take you away from what you were doing. And there is a question about, um, could you use texturizing shears to achieve the effect that you're talking about uh, with the separation? Yes, for sure. Okay. Um, I'm going to hold just one second on that question because I want to talk specifically about texturizing Good. shears in cool. general, if that's okay. Yep, for sure. 
But yes, absolutely, 100%, yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so one little thing about the ins inside outward movement is there's kind of two things we have to choose, both with outside in and inside out, is where do we want the texture to happen? Because if it's just in the ends, then there's not much of a reason for me to be placing my shear in way up here to create that separation. Unless I'm looking to also remove density through that mid strand too. It's complicated, right? So um, if I only want the texture there, even if I'm working it inside out, I'm going to really put my shear right where I want that focus to be. And that's where the, the first contact will happen. Whenever we're working inside outward, we're going to affect the interior of the hair more than if we were working from outside in. Does that make sense? Because that's where the shear is first coming in contact with the hair and vice versa. If I'm working outside in, the place I'm going to affect the hair most is where I first contact the hair, which is on the outside. So again, it's just making that choice a mindful choice versus, well, I just like to slice <laughs> or I just like to slide cut or slither or channel cut or whatever you call it. <laughs> so just mindfully making that decision. So the next thing you want to talk about then is the angle of approach of the shear. So coming back to this specific example down here in the ends, let's blunt her up just a little bit again here. I'm actually going to bring this in a little tighter for you. There we go. So with this, if I want to keep things soft, or even slightly invisible, then the shear, the angle of the approach needs to stay very, very parallel with the hair. Because what happens if I stay very parallel, I'm gonna only take very small pieces of hair away with each cut. So you can see, we can see a tiny bit of separation, but for the most part, you still kept that edge intact. Thanks, Ceylon. So um, if we start to take and we approach at more of an angle, the bigger the angle, the more dramatic that that change is going to be. So if we come in now at more of an angle to the hair, now watch what happens to that visual texture. Now we can actually see that separation and texture happening. So the angle of approach is all about visually, what do you want to see? Same exact thing working inside out. If I want to approach and get super deep into this hair and really affect the interior, inside out is going to be nice, but maybe I just want to remove density. So in that case, I'm going to keep the shear very, very parallel to the hair. And that way, as I'm working, I'm affecting the hair deeper into the strand, but I'm not taking huge pieces out, and we're keeping it more soft. Let's say, and kind of back to those super, super textured bobs and blobs and stuff that were are still very popular. If we want to affect the hair to create that super nice separation, then we need to come in more diagonal to the hair and be willing to be pretty aggressive with the movement so that that way you can actually see that you're gaining that separation much deeper into the hair strand. Then once there's a little bit of curl on, on that or something, a little bit of wave, now we're going to have that separation that we need. So the more diagonal, the more dramatic, the more parallel, the softer it's going to be. So that's two, th just two little things so far. And then that, you know, honestly, if that's all you get from today is just those two little things, that's going to be huge in, in affecting how you approach the texturizing process in your haircut. Sure. So then, so a actually, let, let's go ahead and talk about the texturizing this year, but. Go ahead. Okay, is it is only done through the interior uh, is the question. So 
TM hairstyles, I think you're probably asking because I have the hair clipped up. Um, no, not necessarily. This could be done on the surface. This is throughout the hair. I'm just kind of using this as an isolated piece so that you can just see it really clearly. But no, you definitely, you want to choose this based on where you're at within the haircut. And I'm glad you asked that question because that's actually a really important point. <laughs> <laughs> It's all, it's, it's really overwhelming sometimes, Matt. There's so much information to this, but it's, it's really important that we don't just choose one technique for one area too, and, yeah. or one technique for the entire haircut that we address it piece by piece, because maybe we want the perimeter to still keep weight, but we want it to be really separated. But then we want to see really soft, loose layers hanging over the top of that shape those are going to be different techniques. We might cut the perimeter with like a really deep notch and just focus that texture heavily on the perimeter. Then through the top surface, we might then ele elevate the hair, which we'll talk about in a minute, because we want softness. And then really softly and very parallel to the hair, maybe just gently take some weight out, maybe even grabbing a blending shear at that point. So definitely not just choosing uh, one technique for one area it's just what's the desired result and choose the technique that'll get you to the desired result as efficiently as possible yep hope that helps that's right cool cool okay let's um let's let's actually go to the question on texturizing shears okay because i think that's a good one here you go lynn. Let, me, let me set up another panel here for you lynn Matt, do you do you have regulars that that show up most days? Yes, we call yeah. them, we call them the OGs uh, <laughs> in the chat, and it's funny because I'm watching them. First off, you guys need to do a better job. Start sharing this class right now on whatever <laughs> whatever social platform you're on. You guys know the drill. Share the class right here on whatever platform, and also um, they're hilarious because they're all like you know they they have dance parties in the chat apparently now I, this is it's all becoming their its own thing so yeah they're excited fun. for the dance party and the the dance music and you know it i don't know it's fun so love it yeah gotta keep education fun man yeah red can red can always um, like in their classes they, they uh, what do they say if you're not having fun you're not learning that's true that's true all right let's see all right. Party. Nice. All right. So let's talk about the texturizing shear. Blending shears, thinning shears. Hi, Tara. Good to see you, buddy. <laughs> She's one of our regulars, too. Awesome. There it is. Yeah. Um, okay. So here's the thing is we, we call these shears so many different things, and there's so many different opinions on these. Some people will call these total cheater shears, which we do not agree with in any way, shape, or form, because we feel that everything has a purpose. Where it turns into, um, I think the complaint for some people are with blending or texturizing shears is that we're not doing a good job of sometimes placing um, the structure and the strength of the haircut as a priority. We kind of just like go through and like just kind of whack something in there and then then we get out these and soften everything up, blow, blow some spray wax through it, and <laughs> hey, it's good. Right, yeah. <laughs> Which, hey, let's be honest, there's a place for that too. Yep. The thing with those kinds of haircuts is they don't have a structural element to support them in the long term. So um, if we want to have something that grows out really nice, it's great to have some kind of element to the structure even if it's a really, really highly textured haircut, if it's approached in a way with intent and purpose to it, those kinds of things grow out nicer and have more longevity. So I think that's why people get upset with these kind of shears. The other thing too, just as a side note, just as you're shopping for texturizing shears, people a lot of times will come to our show booth and they'll say, well, how many teeth does that have? 
The thing is, is the actual number of teeth is not necessarily a good way to judge your texturizing shear, because look at these two shears. They're also completely different lengths. <laughs> so right. one person's 32 tooth texturizer. Come on, focus camera. Oh, there it is. There we go. One person's 32 tooth texturizer, if it's a five inch shear, is going to be completely different density of tooth than our shear, which is like a six, I think it's a six and a quarter inch. This one right here, actually, sorry. And so our 32 teeth on that are going to be uh, completely different. Hope that makes sense. But you can also yeah. see the difference between those two. Man, my camera is not wanting to focus today. Come on. There we go. That's good. So you can see the difference in the spacing of each tooth. So um, this shear, the tooth spacing is very, very tight. So if you think about lots of tiny teeth very close together, we're going to get lots of tiny little holes. But that shear can actually remove quite a bit of hair really easily. So then if we go to um, this one, this is called the Invisiblend. You can see that the teeth are further apart. There's more space between them. Uh oh, it's because I have it on face recognition. That's why it keeps wanting to get my face instead of the. It's the like, wait, thing. I see him. I see. Yeah, him. I'll, I'll step out for a second. <laughs> there we go. There you go. So um, the other thing is this, or sorry, this blade, isn't very sharp. It's actually somewhat polished down so that it has a little slip to it. So with this shear, because the tooth spacing is further apart and only the teeth really do the cutting, you can actually be quite aggressive, but not a ton of hair comes out. So when you're looking at texturizing shears, look at the size of the, the tooth itself. Look at the spacing of the teeth, because that's going to tell you a lot on what effect you're going to get from the shear. Hope that makes sense. For sure. So here's the thing. The other, the other challenge with this shear is we don't call it a texturizing shear. We call it a blending shear. Because if you use it just kind of in the typical manner that most people will, which is just to place the shear into the hair and close it and slide out, that's going to make a much more blended, soft texture because you're putting tiny little holes into the hair. So tiny little holes aren't going to show a lot of like separated texture and movement in the hair. The tiny little holes are going to take weight out and soften things. Now, that being said, you can definitely create very textured looks by camping out in a spot and working this way. So um, that then is going to create more of a separation similar to what we saw with the other shear. And then the question always comes up, well, why would I do that instead of just pick up a regular shear? Because you had to open and close it like 16 times. Right. That's still going to have a softness to it that the other shear won't. Because it's not going to catch every single hair. It's not going to be as defined. So it's going to be a little bit softer. And our, one of our other favorite techniques that we show very, very often is a weave and blend. So you actually take a solid piece of the shear and weave through, and then you can kind of camp out. There you can actually create some very distinct texture within the hair, especially at low elevation like that. It's gonna be really pretty visual. If you lift the elevation higher, then it's a, of course gonna soften it. Again. So you have those options with the shear you can definitely get a lot of different um, different results from it. The other thing to think about too is if I put those short pieces in, what effect do those short pieces have on the overall shape? So, um, yeah, cool. I think that's enough. We'll we'll pause there. If you have other specific questions about blending shears, go ahead and throw them in. I'll be happy to ask them. But, I mean, I could honestly just do a whole class on blending shears. <laughs> yeah, right. So I'm, I'm kind of giving you guys the, like, the details, but from a pretty 10,000-foot um, perspective, I guess. Very true. 
All right, guys, so, here's the deal. I need you to, on Facebook, my so my, my people on YouTube right now, there's lots of people on YouTube. I need you guys to share, hit the share button, and share it to Facebook. Let's get more people on Facebook. And if you're on Facebook already, you hit the share button. Okay? All right. Keep going. We Good just job, gotta, Matt. We got to fill this room, you know what I'm saying? That's right. <laughs> I'm okay with a small room because it's nice and intimate, but hey, let's, you know, let's get some more people in here. You won't feel the difference. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's all, yeah, all the same for me. Yeah, right. Okay, so I'm going to touch on elevation and over direction kind of quickly because I also want to talk about how our texturizing processes affect the different fab fabrics. So first thing is we have to be conscious that elevation and over direction have the exact same res or effect to the hair that they do with a regular pair of shears or with a regular cutting process. So, all you have to do to understand this point is just go right back to your foundations of hair cutting, your principles of hair cutting, which is, let's just keep it super simple. With elevation, the higher and higher we elevate hair as we cut, the further and further it has to return to natural fall to, to show what you've done. So that let's use a real easy to see example here. Let's start at no elevation and let's just put a chop in the hair. That is extremely apparent, yes? <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> let's take that now. Let's do kind of a low elevation to it, almost more like a graduation sort of ele elevation. Still cut blunt. Now, much softer, right? Let's go on really high elevation all the way straight up towards the ceiling. Open another blunt chop in there. And as that returns, now we're going to have a lot of softness to it. And that's with no point cutting. So the same exact thing happens with your texturizing process. If I want to, if I have this here and I'm like, man, I'd really like to see some really, really uh, specific separation, separated pieces there. What we see a lot of times is people will take the hair, elevate it up and start like slide cutting a bunch through these ends. Then they drop it back down and it's like, uh, okay, it just looks fuzzier. Yeah. <laughs> it's just more separated. And it's two things. Number one, the technique might not have been the, the perfect technique for it, but if it, also if it's at high elevation, even if we use a pretty aggressive technique at high elevation, let's actually do that weave and blend technique at high elevation because I think that will give a great visual. So, um, hang on. Let me set this up a little differently for you. If I take that section, elevate all the way to the ceiling, let's take our shear and just kind of weave in there. Now we're just going to kind of blunt up some pieces. Now if I slide that out, you can see definitely a couple of nice blunt pieces in there. But as that returns back down to natural fall, you are not going to see those blunt pieces. So even something that That's aggressive good. at high elevation is not going to yield super visual separation. Does that make sense? That's really good. Yep. So if we want visual impact, lower elevation is probably going to be better. But you also have to be a little cautious because <laughs> even the elevation and the cutting line that you're putting in can also affect the overall silhouette that you create. So for example, if like if we have a blunt bob down here, just a really heavy one length haircut, if I pick that up to low elevation and texturize sort of almost like a graduated pattern into that, when that falls, it's removing weight from the bottom, but it's actually starting to build weight towards the, visually build weight towards the top because you're gonna have that little bit of internal graduation. I probably shouldn't have even said that because that opens Pandora's box <laughs> way too much. <laughs> but same exact principle with your over direction. 
with over direction, let's say I want things to continue to push towards the face. I want that kind of short to long to still happen, even with my texturizing, then of course I'm gonna over direct back away from the face because that's gonna set up that texturizing pattern to fall towards the face, short in the back, longer in the front. What texturizing shear did you just use for that? That was our signature, ser signature series reversible blending shear. And what's, what do you mean by reversible for everybody? So you'll notice the handle yep. is set so you can use it in both positions. I can have the blunt blade here. Or I can switch it. Yeah, I can that's... have one blade on the opposite side. That's key so for me. So here's what happens is like if like if I if I want to camp out, let's say right here and really kind of like take some hair off, I can do that if the blunt blade's on the bottom because that keeps returning the hair back into gravity. If I flip them where the teeth are facing outward, as soon as I do that, now I can't really cut anything anymore because the, the hair that's left is trapped between the teeth. So that's one thing, because ergonomically, we want to set ourselves up so that we're not doing this kind of stuff to try and get the blade in the right place. So that's one of the reasons we make them um, reversible like that. The other thing too is that because a blending shear doesn't cut everything really perfectly and evenly, it can actually influence the ends just a bit too. So point the teeth in the direction you want to influence the hair to go. So if I want to keep this hair kind of rolling under, the ends under, then I point the teeth under. If for some reason I wanted those ends to almost kind of poke out a little bit, I could poke the teeth out. Snowden, you're asking them left-handed. We do have a left-handed version of pretty much all of our shears, but the reversibleness doesn't mean left-handed or right-handed. It just means that you can switch the position. In your right hand, right? Correct, in yeah. the right hand. Okay. Yeah. Or left-hand if you purchase a left-handed version. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Sweet. Cool. <clears throat> so let's let's talk about because we've been showing this on nice, straight, smooth hair just to get the, the idea. All of the, everything that we just said does not change based on pattern. So if I have a curl pattern, there's kind of a medium curl pattern here, everything that I just shared with you is exactly the same, except for now we have to think about hair binding together to form curls. And this, this is the big thing, and it's a big difference between if the hair is going to be worn straight, maybe with a little bit of wave, or if it's actually gonna be worn with curl, with curl. If it's going to be worn with curl, there has to be enough material sitting next to each curl for the curl to actually form. Now, <clears throat> There's kind of a lot of theories on this, and I don't want to kind of get too far into that because it's it's tough. I mean, I don't know that anyone's done a study to see if curls always show up in the same pattern. Like on this square of the scalp, you know, do the, do these hundred hairs always form one curl with the same pattern to it? Or do some days this one kind of joins these hairs over here to make a curl? So, because sometimes people do say you should always cut it as it is and to the pattern. And I think that's a smart thing to do. Whether or not that same curl is going to collect together the next day, I don't know. I'm not, I'm not sure that we've ever mm, yeah, actually studied point. that and seen that. So, what we have to think about, and I love Sam on his Curlicious DVD, he, he just kept saying... Eh, um, the ends need friends. <laughs> and I think that that is the best way to think about if you're going to texturize curly hair in any way, shape, or form, whether it's point cutting from the outside in, whether it's slide cutting from the inside out, we just have to remember that if we do not want this curl to become separated, then we need to make sure it has friends next to it to be able to collect together and form that curl. Here's the thing is you guys know that 
every curl is different because, you know, this is kind of like a medium pattern. Or if we have like a super tight pattern, it also depends on texture because if this is fine, if it's medium, if it's coarse, this is going to react very differently to whatever texturizing technique you use. Because a lot of people, you know, they'll say like, well, never ever do this and never ever do that. And, you know, they'll watch someone like Gerard Scarpacy take a razor and cut curly hair with a razor and everyone's heart stops. They're like, oh my gosh, how would you ever cut curly hair with a razor? And it's right. like, stop thinking about absolutes because each pattern, density, texture, it all combines together differently. So, um, like, for example, with my wife's hair, because she's got, if you, if you curl her, or if you let her hair just go naturally curly, it's about this pattern. Maybe a little tighter, actually. But with her hair, because she does go through some processes to smooth things out, even if she wears her hair curly, I can be much more aggressive with her hair. So I, I can get pretty crazy with my texturizing and not leave too many friends next to each other because she's got a ponytail like this big around too, like it's super, super dense. Right. So when I'm going through the texturizing process on her hair, we have two things that we're trying to do. We're trying to reduce the bulk and create visual separation. And since she does have the ability to work with her curl and to get some polish into it, she can do that. But if she was like, no, I just wash and go every single day. I don't like product. I just like to kind of like scrunch it in a little bit, you know, squeeze some product in there, run out the door. That client's going to be different too, because with that person, I probably do need to be more careful with how much I separate that out. Most of the time, I'm going to say most of the time, <laughs> because we're not going to talk about absolutes. Yep. Most of the time, we want to choose texturizing techniques that will leave the hair more deliberately intact. So what that means is something like a slide cutting technique where we're just kind of taking more of a piece out of the hair versus kind of like putting tons of little holes in it, most likely is going to be safer to still maintaining something in the curl. So being more deliberate with your texturizing. And I actually had a girl in my clientele that was not quite this small of a, of a pattern, but definitely the intensity of the pattern, like the tightness of the pattern. But the, they, they kind of formed a little bit wider, but they would shrink up this much. So if I cut her hair wet, which I actually did do, which I actually, that's another big debate is should you cut it wet, should you cut it dry, whatever. But when, when with her hair, it would spring up so much. But what would happen is as it would spring up, it would also become so dense because she had a lot of, she had a lot of density to the hair as well. And it was a pretty coarse texture. So what would happen is it would kind of bounce up and it would get so solid. And she just was like, gosh, it just feels like just such this dense thing sitting on my head. So what we would do, is we would go into the interior and I would literally just grab entire curls and clip them out. Just entire, a whole curl at a time. And I would bricklay that going up the head now, the compromise to doing that is it definitely increased kind of the interior fullness and volume to the hair because those short little pieces in there created some structure. And so her hair would kind of go out a little bit more. Yeah. But what was cool is it had a lot of expansion to it, but it felt so much more airy through the ends. So there was kind of a little bit of a compromise there because those shorter hairs on the interior, what they did was they, um, like I said, they created some expansion and push. So she had more height to the hair, but the individual strands had a lot more separation and movement to it. Everything you do in haircutting 
yeah, I'd be willing to pretty much say almost everything you do in haircutting is going to have a benefit to it, and yeah. it's going to have a slight compromise in some other way. Like, there's just no perfection. Because <clears throat> with each decision, we're going to have to kind of weigh out, well, do are we okay with a little more volume for the separation? Are we okay with a little less density for a separation? Think of a, of a, you know, maybe a girl that has super fine straight hair, nice little bob like this, but she doesn't have much density to her hair. That particular client, of course, they want to see texture because they've never had it. Like everyone always says, well, you have to cut it blonde so that it stays dense. Well, if you cut really deliberate pieces into that that perimeter, yes, it kind of affects density. But if you keep your angles really deliberate, it doesn't necessarily take too much density away, but it gives you the the benefit of creating some visual separation. Yeah. So it's all benefit and compromise, right? Yeah, I like that. Very cool. So uh, does anybody have questions for Andrew here? Um, if you do, type Q, put your question real quick um, so he can answer them. Uh, otherwise, is there – so what else – uh, with Sam Via and everything you guys got going on. Did you want to talk about that for a second and kind of go over some things? Yeah, of course. So we have two events that we're planning right now. The first one is to specifically address what's happening in our world right now, which it just sucks that it has to be this way. But now's the time that we get to make some, do something different. Yep. So um, Sammy is organizing a, an incredible crew of black artists and educators for a, a a event that we're calling the fabric of change cool and it's going to be a fundraiser just like we did with um uh, gosh what did we call the show the show must go on oh yeah it's gonna be a fundraiser um for the bjcc definitely the focus is to show that there are so many incredible artists and educators in the black community that just haven't had the platform and the, the voice to get out there so we have the platform and that's that's how we want to support yeah is sure. to get the voice out there yeah that's happening on june 28th okay we're still confirming all the artists so that will be coming out soon then in july towards the end of july we're going we're still in the planning phase for this so i'm not sure exactly what the the concept of this particular education is going to be but we're going to do two weekends two sundays towards the end of july just a, again, big education festival, lots of so hair awesome. and <laughs> help hairdressers grow. That's very cool. Um, all right. So, uh, here's a, here's a question for you. Uh, th- my, like my mind is blown. All right, Jess, uh, can we come back? <laughs> Need a minute or an hour. That's funny. Okay. Um, what, here it is. Jess McCaw. What's the plow shear Andrew used? plow shear maybe the maybe the slide cutting shear i don't know possibly what, possibly that, that's the only plow analogy i can think yeah so this is the artist series slide cutting shear or the sambia artist series slide cutting shear i gotta step out of frame here so it'll focus there we go so um, this particular shear is the one that allows the hair to push through the hair that that's what i think she means by plow maybe yeah oh actually i think i said this one will plow through the hair. Oh, yeah, you're right. Yep. Yeah, okay. Yeah, so this right. is actually, that sorry, makes sense. the Signature Series 7-inch dry cutting shear. So this shear, there we go. Um, this particular shear is in our Signature Series. It's a 7-inch shear. It has that sword blade to it. And this one, you Plus. cut, hair falls off. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. Uh, all right, cool. And then... Um, Oh, so Lynn, so Lynn asked a question earlier, um, and it was about her client, I believe has straight hair on top, curly hair underneath, Jess is reminding us. So I think it was, she's saying like, what do you do when you have a client with maybe multiple textures in hair? That's a hard question. question to answer, but maybe you could kind of, with the professional that you are, maybe you can twist that a little bit. It, it's honestly a really simple answer, and it's you address each area based on what you see. Good. It's, re- 
is really that straightforward because it's kind of like we were talking about earlier. I think what sometimes we do as hairdressers, and we were taught this in school because we were taught, here's a haircut that you put on someone's head. Instead of here are a combination of elevations over directions and finger angles and techniques that produce this end result. And by the way, you can use 16 different versions of that on every different piece of the head if that's what needs to happen. Yeah. So really what I would suggest, Lynn, is through the haircut itself and through the texturizing process, dress the hair almost looking at it. Of course, you need to keep in perception the entire silhouette, the entire result. But I would really kind of look at the hair in those independent pieces like, OK, this is this text. This is this curl pattern through here with that curl pattern. Let's say this was on the entire head. How would I approach that? Oh, up here on top where it's actually really kind of straight and flat. If this was just a client that had straight flat hair, how would I approach that? So you can combine the different techniques and the different processes that should give you a little bit more of a balanced end result. And <laughs> I think it's so important that that we have realistic expectations too. Because if this is stick straight and this is super curly, it's it's probably not going, unless they're willing to put in the blow drying time and work, there's no hair cutting process that's yeah. gonna make those things match. Yep. Like that's, that's thinking we can take something that has multiple different movements to it and somehow magically make them not have those movements to it, which yeah. that's just not gonna happen. For me, I mean, obviously you would have, if you have a curly, super curly underneath, super straight top, um, realistically uh, they're not going to curl the top to match the bottom so you're going to have to teach them and blow drying underneath to me is a lot easier if you want to smooth that out so blow dry that smooth as a as a stylist i would cut that i would cut it all kind of maybe do even dry cutting this mm -hmm. is what i would do and then um and then teach them to smooth it like you're saying like they got to put in the time uh but it should be a pretty easy process to teach them to smooth the underneath and then they have a smooth haircut and then they could always wave it, curl it, do things with it after you get the textures all the same, but you got to coach them on how to, how to match those things up. I think. Lovely. Sweet. Um, thank you everybody. Um, it's so difficult. I understand. Uh, you know, we have, oh, we all have those clients that have like, you know, just super challenging hair. Yeah. Unique things. That's why, you know, we're professionals in that way. Um, so Doris question is the wide teeth preferred for thick curly hair or the tight teeth? What do you I'm think? I'm assuming she means on, and well, there's kind of two answers, Doris. I think you're asking about the texturizing shear. So um, this is one thing that you got to be really careful with, with your texturizing and blending shears is if you Again, if you put a lot of tiny little holes into hair that wants to expand, that's going to um, make it want to come apart. So with curly hair, this probably isn't the best choice to just use as a traditional blending shear because it's gonna create too many tiny little holes and that's what creates that frizzy and, and the fluffiness. Can you use a blending shear on curl? Yes, you can that weave and blend technique that I, I showed you earlier, that's actually a fun technique. So if I uh, take pieces, and Jessica, the one that I, I was telling you about, this is kind of the approach I would take with her hair sometimes too. If I do that, that gives us three pieces here and three pieces there. So those potentially have the ability to form actual curls with those pieces because we left the ends having some friends. Now, of course, we're going to have those three shorter pieces on the interior too. This is something that I would keep more on the interior of a haircut so that we don't have pokey pieces up here on top, unless that's what you're looking for, which I doubt it is. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, so you just wanna be a little cautious with blending shears with any kind of hair, whether it's straight, curly, tight curls, all of those, if they have a propensity to get into a frizzy state, putting too many tiny little holes can be problematic. Okay. Very cool. 
All right, sweet. So I hope you guys enjoyed this class with Andrew. Andrew, thank you so much for uh, coming on here and sharing education. I know uh, Sam's coming on, right? Um, mm-hmm. Monday. I think right? we have him I for the 20. Soon. I know it's soon. Yeah, I think I have to be here. Let's see. Yeah, I think it's the 20. Yep, 22nd. 22nd. Yep, so Sam V is coming on here. So we got lots of Sam V love the, the next seven days here. And uh, so it, if you guys are interested in anything that Andrew put out there, please go to Sam Via. It's just Sam Via.com, right? Uh, yes. Scissors, all the, you know, all the stuff he was talking about today. If you guys are interested in it, go check it out. Um, also follow everything Sam Via is doing on all their social stuff. <laughs> if you're not already, uh, most of you guys probably are. So thank you, Andrew, so much. I uh, always love our uh, our team up a kind of teamwork that we that we do here. Um, I love the relationship I have with you guys. Um, so tell everybody I said hi, and I can't wait to have you back on here for sure. Thanks, Matt. I appreciate the time, and thanks all of you for watching and asking questions. Yeah, everyone's saying thank you so much. So uh, all right, so we'll talk to you soon. Thank you. All right, see you, Andrew. See ya. All right, guys. So let me see here. Um, so. Thank you guys so much for being a part of today's class uh, with Andrew. I hope you guys enjoyed it. Uh, it was super fun uh, having him on here always. And, you know, he's just super smart and, you know, knows the craft really well. And those of you guys out there that want to learn more, uh, not only our YouTube channel, but Sam Via's YouTube channel is obviously amazing. So uh, thank you guys. I see you guys in the chat. If you have it, two things I need you to do. Uh, if you haven't signed up for FSE now, make sure you go sign up for the app. It's free. Uh, it's a community-based app. You can build a profile online. Um, you can uh, share your work. It's a community-based thing. It's basically if Instagram and Netflix had a baby, it would be FSE now. So you can learn education, watch videos, watch all these classes, everything. And then also Sam Via Education is on there. And then you can as well um, share your work, ask questions on the community, like people's stuff, uh, you know, and just get involved. And that's all these fun people in the chat, uh, today, they're all on there sharing their work. So you guys could go join them, have some fun. Thousands of stylists are on there already. So here is the app, uh, commercial. We're going to come back. We're going to do a little small, crank up the music, let you guys dance down a little bit. And then, uh, then we're going to go for the day. So, uh, check out the app. Hope you guys uh, like it. Here it is, and I'll be right back. There you go. <laughs> Let's see those dance emojis in the uh, chat. I know you guys have been waiting the whole time. So uh, thank you, Lynn. There you go. All right. Snowden, thank you. That's right. That's right. Whoops. I went away. Uh, that's right. There you go. All right, very cool, guys. Thank you so much for uh, being on here live every day. You guys are the best. Uh, it's so fun. I look forward to this every day. Uh, tomorrow, I've got a, another special guest from uh, Paul Mitchell, my friend Colin Caruso. We're going to do some hair color with you guys, I hope. I hope. <laughs> we'll see. If not, I'll do hair color tomorrow. We'll see what happens. But uh, another fun day planned for you guys. So um, that's about it. Thank you. Thank you guys. Good to see you guys. <laughs> Let this be known. There you go, Jess. Thanks, Adele. Simone. Facebook, good to see you today. Good to see you, Facebook. <laughs> All right, cool. All right, guys, what do we say at the end of the show? 
It's going to be a great day. Thank you guys so much. I'll see you tomorrow. Thanks, Andrew Carruthers, Sam Villa, all of you guys. You guys are the best. I'll see you at 12 o'clock Eastern Standard Time tomorrow. Bye, guys. It's going to be a great day. Chop it, clip it, spray it, flip it. I woke up this way. It's going to be a great day. Chop it, clip it, spray it, flip it. Let me show you the way. It's gonna be a great day. Chop it, clip it, spray it, flip it. I woke up this way. It's gonna be a great day. Chop it, clip it, spray it, flip it.